to another episode of the DBR Spotlight Podcast. This is your host, Pastor Evan, and here at Compass, we exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ by reaching people for Christ, teaching people to be like Christ, and training people to serve Christ. And everything that we do, including all the podcasts, is to fulfill that mission to reach, teach, and train. Well, Compass Bible Church, we are continuing in the Gospel of John, and it's been a great journey, and, and now we are in a point in our church's history, uh, or just in our daily Bible reading, I should say, that we have bumped into controversy. We have some scriptural controversy. I actually have a couple extra resources I want to let you know about so that you are equipped to understand not only how we got what God's word, but what is actually God's word. So we have John chapter eight to verse uh, chapter ten this week in our daily Bible reading. But you might be reading something this week that's actually not in the Bible. John chapter eight, well actually John chapter seven verse fifty three and eight all the way uh, chapter eight verse eleven is not in the Bible. And you see this right here in this little text right here. You know, they, thankfully the scholars wrote this down. Said the earliest manuscripts do not include John seven fifty three to eight eleven. I promised you last week that I would explain what this means, because really, if you go all the way back to John three uh, seven, sorry, John chapter seven verse thirty seven. Uh, and jump right to verse 12 in chapter 8, this flow of thought from 37 to 52, and you skip right to 12, is one long train of thought. There was a scribe back in the day that added this story of Jesus into the Gospel of John. Now, did this happen? Maybe. That is the best thing we can say, that the event with the, the woman caught in adultery really is the, the strongest thing we can say is a maybe. Now, maybe it was part of the oral traditions that was recorded and written down that probably may have happened, but scripturally, it didn't, it didn't happen, at least in terms of what John wrote down. John did not write this down from what we can gather through the archaeological finds of all the manuscripts. Now, if you look at a Roman Catholic Bible, just like this Bible, they're going to say, no, it is in the Bible, and this is an important part of the Bible, but they base it because the Roman Vul the, excuse me, the Latin Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Greek Old, uh, New Testament, has it in there. Why? Because the Latin Vulgate was using later manuscripts that they found versus the earlier manuscripts that, that we have today, which reveal it's not in there, and if you take it out... John makes a whole lot more sense without it. Now, there's biblical theology in there. It's not the first time Jesus said to someone, go sin no more. That is very normal. People picking up stones to execute someone, very normal in the gospel of John, even though it was illegal uh, for them to do it. Um, but what about uh, Stephen and Acts? Well, we'll get there when we read Acts. But so the thing I want to make sure that you understand is one, John 7.53 to 8.11 is not in the Bible. Now, how do we know that? It's through the science of textual criticism. Now, what is textual criticism? Well, you just read it, saying that earlier manuscripts do not contain these verses. So we have copies and copies and copies and copies and copies of the Bible, of different books of the Bible, uh, of different verses of the Bible, really. We have thousands, thousands, over, I think, over 5,000 uh, manuscripts of partial copies to full copies of the New Testament. And we have plenty of uh, copies of the Old Testament as well. And what we can do is, and here's actually the news, we don't have the original manuscripts. They're, they're dust. They don't exist any longer. But do, the question is, do we have the original words? And that answer is yes. And the way that we figure out the original words based on all the manuscript scripts that we have left over is comparing them all to one another and then seeing how they actually unify together to show us what the original words were written down by John, in, in this case, in the Gospel of John. 
Now, to learn more about this, ask Pastor Hayden and I. We have actually quite an uh, extensive, um, li- well, not extensive library on this, I should say. We have a library on this. We have lectures that we would send you, and there's two books I'd recommend uh, in just a moment. But for what you need to understand is like, how do we get the Bible? It's not like the Mormon church, you know, the, the false church that is the LDS, where they believe that golden tablets were preserved that Joseph Smith found that were written by God. God didn't act like that. He acted in space and time through man to write down his word, his inspired word, the verbal plenary word of God. Verbal meaning the words itself are the words itself are from God and plenary meaning all that all the words are from God. Now that is the original words, not the ones that may have been added in as we see in John 57, 53 to 8 verse 11. Now, a good resource, a good uh, starting one is this book by Timothy Paul Jones. He's a professor at Southern Seminary and actually was my professor uh, of apologetics is how we got the Bible. This little book right here is a very good 30,000 foot overview of how we got the Old Testament and how we got the New Testament and how we know we have the words of God uh, written in our Bibles today and that we didn't add things by accident. And actually, you'll notice there's some verses in 1 John or in Acts or throughout the, the Bible that it skips numbers, and it's a big controversy for some people because the King James Version has it, and this is why we're not King James-only Bi- uh, Bible churches, because the King James uses manuscripts later. We use manuscripts from an earlier time to get our Bibles. And the other book I would recommend, I highly recommend, it's a little Thicker, as you can see, compared to this book right here. This book I've really enjoyed by Norman Geisler, who is actually one of the lead textual critics in the world, called The General Introduction to the Bible. And this, uh, let me see how many pages this is. I mean, this 600-page book is just the introduction to to how we got the Bible. This book, I would highly recommend, I recommend, highly recommend both books, How We Got the Bible by Timothy Paul Jones and The General Introduction to the Bible by Norman Geisler and William Nix. These uh, Geisler is one of the top text, textual critics in the world, and this he's an expert in this field, and I would highly recommend you having it so that you can correctly understand how we got, got God's Word so that you can, one, make it a defense of the faith that you have, and two, be able to study God's actual words for you to apply them. If you have questions, please find me at church, and I'd love to explain more. But we have some Bible to talk about. We got to get through a lot of amazing things in John chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. So beginning in uh, chapter 8 and verse 12. Remember the context. This is coming from the conversation in chapter 7, verses 37, that Jesus is the living water and the controversy that followed afterward. So Jesus picks up right again after verses 52 of chapter 7, jumping to verse 12 of 8. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. This is the next I am statement. This is the second I am statement that Jesus has, second out of seven, saying, I am the light of the world. Essentially, he brings light into the darkness. In Psalm 43, God sends out, we ask for God to send out his light. Jesus is the light. So that's a fulfillment of prophecy right there. And then we see actually in John chapter nine, Jesus proving that as he gives a man who only sees darkness Uh, He actually is able to see light for the first time. But Jesus is the light. He's able to shine bright in the darkness into the dark world. And John chapter 1 and John chapter 3, Jesus entered the world, the dark world, and shined his light. But some believed, but some didn't. So Jesus emphasizes in verses 14, verses 15, and on is that his testimony is true. His judgment is true. Um, trying to combat the false things the Pharisees were saying about him, trying to say, no, no, I am who I say I am saying I am. That almost made no sense, but it makes sense if you think about it. Jesus is saying, I am who I say I am. And the people are saying, I don't believe you. So continuing in John chapter 8, they ask him in verse 25, who are you? And Jesus says to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning He doesn't give him an answer. Why? Because he's been giving them answer. I am the light. I am the bread. I am the son of God. And he 
uh, references John chapter 3 and verses 28 of chapter 8. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. He's obviously referring to the cross, but the cross is a, is a fulfillment of what happened in Numbers with Moses when they were attacked by snakes for their disobedience. God told Moses to raise up a snake, a bronze serpent, and raise them up for people to see, which is a little ironic because wasn't a snake that it was at the fall? But God, redeeming all things, he raised up the bronze serpent for people to see. And if people look at it, they will be healed. That's all they have to do. That's what belief looks like. You repent from where you're looking and turn to what you need to look at. And Jesus is saying, when you look away from what you're looking at and repent and look at me and believe in me, you will be saved. And then for them here, in verse 28, they will know who he is. And as he says these things in verse 30, many believed in him. Now, this is where John defines what it means to believe. It doesn't mean to simply ascend to the facts to be in agreement, or is there something more to say, no, to be- really believe is to confess, is to repent, is to follow. Well, Jesus is about to clarify that in verse 30, when he believed in him. So what does he do in verse 31? So Jesus starts turning to those and say, I'm talking to everyone over here. Oh, you believed in me. Guess what? I'm talking to you right now. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. So he's talking to them. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you'll know the truth and truth will set you free. Saying, if you follow me, you will have salvation. And so they said in verse 33, we are offspring of Abraham. We've never been a slave to anyone. Then Jesus answered them. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. He's not talking about perfectionism is required, meaning that if you are in practicing unrepentant sin that you cannot get out of, you're a slave to sin. When and what is a slave in the household? Verse 35, a slave cannot remain in the house forever. Only the son remains forever. They were saying that they're sons of Abraham, but Jesus was saying, you're not. You're enslaved to sin, therefore a slave. You're not a true son of Abraham who actually had saving faith. And so they said, Abraham is our father. We are descendants. We are Jews. And Jesus challenged them saying, if you were Abraham's children, you would do, you'd be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth that I heard from God. They were wanting to kill him because of him saying that they were saying that he blasphemed, meaning that he, as a man, called himself God, as we'll read later. But Jesus is saying, just because you say you're a son of Abraham, and you might be biologically a son of Abraham, you're not a son of Abraham because Abraham had faith, you don't. In Compass, that's what we understand. Just because your parents or grandparents are Christians doesn't mean you are a Christian. You are only a Christian when you have saving faith in Christ, when you repent of your sins and trust in Christ. And really the heart, our actions reveal our heart out of the abundance of the mouth, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and our, really our actions are the abundance of the heart. So Jesus challenges them in verse 44 of chapter eight, that you are the father, uh, you are the father, your father is the devil and you're doing his will and his desires. Their fruit of their lives really reveal that they're not sons of Abraham or sons of God, rather sons of the devil. And he tells, tells them why they don't believe is because you do not hear because you're not of God. So then the tension gets a little even higher in verses 48 to the end of the chapter. And so he begins to really start to associate himself as greater than Abraham. And they're going, well, hold up. You think you're better than Abraham? You, the prophet, he, he died. How do you say you're, you've, you know Abraham? How do you know the prophets? But Jesus drops the biggest I am statement out there. And this is why I love, I get the chills every time I read it. He's saying, I know him, but you don't know him. You say you know him, but I really know him. And like, how do you, how do you know him? You're not even 50 years old. And Jesus is like, no, you, you just don't get it. You really don't get it, do you? I am God. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. As a reminder, the I am statements refer back to Exodus when Moses was at the burning bush. He asked God, who, who do I, how do, what do I call you? Because they're going to ask me, who do you follow? He says, I am who I am. And so Jesus is associating himself as God saying, before Abraham was, I am. And here's the thing. You might not get it, but verse 59, they got it. They picked up stones to throw at him because, uh, but, uh, but Jesus hid himself and went from the, out of the temple. 
They got it. They understood his words, and you and I need to understand his words. And one of the questions we ask ourselves when reading John, who is Jesus saying he is? Jesus is saying he is God, and people understand it. He's saying that he is the light of the world and that he is God. And what is the next question? What does he do to prove it? Well, let's read John chapter 9. What is it happens in John chapter 9? That Jesus is the light. He proves it. How? That a, a man blind from birth who only saw darkness, it's all he knew was darkness. And it's a kind of a theological metaphor right here that all we know is spiritual darkness. He's going to shine bright for us to see. And the question is, well, how are you going to respond? And so people ask him, why was he blind? Was it because of his sin? And it says, no, it's just to showing that God works all things together for his glory. Verse three, it's not the man has sinned or his parents have sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. The point of the man being blind is so that Jesus can come in time and space to prove that he is the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, in the world, verse five, I am the light of the world. So he heals him. And the man in verse seven came back seeing and thus proving Jesus is the light of the world. Now verses eight, all the way to the end of the chapter is this honestly very hilarious dialogue between the Pharisees and the man who was healed. They bring him before to try him. They don't believe that it was him. They bring his parents. The parents are like, no, that's our son. And we don't know what's going on and because they're, they're scared of their persecution. And so they bring this guy back in saying, hey, let's be real. You know, glorify God. Call this guy a sinner. And he's like, no, I'm not. Um, he's saying, why, why should I do that? He healed me. You know that God doesn't hear or listen to sinners. But anyone who's a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. He's being a true apologetic. They understood this. And this is why God says, ask anything in my name. If you love God and know God and worship him and follow his will and ask anything in his will, he listens. And so the guy goes, well, he prayed. It happened. So clearly he's in God's will. And so, and furthermore, I'm not apologetic. Verse 32 of chapter nine, never since this world began, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind, which is true. And so they, he kind of mocks them. Like, don't, don't, you should be worshiping God. You should be worshiping with this guy. And they talk, no, you were born out of your sin. Get out of here. So they casted him out. They are persecuted. And what do we remember in Matthew? We learn about at our church and our sermon, blessed are the persecuted. The kingdom is theirs. And that's the sad part. The man who was blind, who saw, really sees versus the people who see, but really are blind. They think they have the kingdom of heaven, but they don't. This blind, blind man does because he follows and believes in Christ. So verses 35 to 41 are such amazing verses that you should have starred or bracketed. Jesus heard that the, the, the Pharisees cast this man out and he found him and he says, do you believe in the son of man? And the man answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. Now, did Jesus ever say he is God? Yeah, yes, he did. He didn't say those words, but he's saying, yeah, I, the person talking to you is the son of God. And so the man understands it, verse 38, and he says, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Well, he's just saying that, you know, Jesus is only saying that he's human, a really special human. Well, why is this man worshiping him? And Jesus accepting his worship because Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the God. And really showing what true belief looks like. True belief looks like worship. You see, the man was once standing and now he's worshiping. He's repentant. He's humbling himself. And so what does true belief look like? Well, look at him. He worshiped God. He got down and worshiped him. So he repented and trusted in him. So Jesus says this little side comment over here for the judgment and came into the world, referring to John chapter three, that those who may see who, who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Jesus is saying, I'm talking about you. And so now in chapter 10, this is where Jesus brings out the big beat down guns. Because this conversation continues in chapter 10. You, ha you must remember. But what you need to do, compass is in chapter 10 is you need to write down Ezekiel 34 and actually you need to stop right now read Ezekiel 34 and then come back here and start reading John chapter 10. Jesus is calling out how blind they are 
Why? Because these are the Pharisees. These are the supposed leaders, shepherds of Israel who are supposed to be teaching God's truth, but they're not. They're rejecting God. And what does Ezekiel 34 talk about? It's talking about God's prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. And I would recommend stop this video, read Ezekiel 34 in its entirety. You're going to see how God calls out the, the priests, the leadership of Israel at, his, at Ezekiel's time, saying how they are weak shepherds, that they didn't take care of the sheep. Instead, they indulged in themselves. And how God will say, I will seek them out. I will be the shepherd for my people. I will gather them in and I will feed them in a good pasture. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost. I will bring them back back the strayed. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. And that's in Ezekiel 34 at the very end. He says, I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be the prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I mean, I got a little chills just reading that because Jesus reveals that he is the good shepherd. He has two I am statements. One, I am the door to the sheep. I am the one that guards them and protects them. That's the next I am statement that we have here. That's the third I am statement. And number four, in verse 11, I, you know, sorry, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In verse 11, referring back to Ezekiel 34. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. You see how God in Ezekiel 34 shows that he is the shepherd and he's going to appoint uh, uh, someone as the one shepherd. And Jesus is claiming deity right here as that son of man, as God, saying, I am the good shepherd that lays his, down, it lays his life down for the sheep. I'm not a hired worker that just ditches when it gets hard. No, I am the good shepherd. In my own, I know my own, my own know me. And verse 17, this is much beautiful verses in the whole Bible, verses 17 to 18. For this reason, the father loves me because I laid down my life and uh, laid down my life and I take it up again. No one takes uh, it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I receive from my father. Referencing back to Isaiah 53, how we as sheep have, were astray, but he has laid himself down for our iniquities. So people call him crazy and, um, but others were saying, this guy's not crazy. He's not possessed by a demon. How can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So then after that, just amazing part of scripture, we have the end of John chapter 10, beginning in verse 22, Jesus uniting himself with the father. So there's another, a feast of dedication took, took place at Jerusalem during winter. Again, showing that this is a Gentile audience that John is writing to. And the Jews are gathering around Jesus and saying, how long will you just keep us in suspense? Can you just tell us plainly that you are the Christ? And what I love about Jesus, he says this in verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. Jesus said, I said it. Over and over. I mean, how clear do I need to get? I'm referring back to the Old Testament. I'm proving it with works, but you, you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. How do you want to know that? Uh, how do you not want to know that I am God? Look at the works I'm doing that God promised back in the Old Testament. But you don't believe. Why? Because you're not among my sheep. Well, that would have been stinging rebuke right there because, like, I'm a son of Abraham. I'm, I'm a Jew. I'm automatically in. You know, I'm, my grandparents are Christians. My parents are Christians. I'm on automatically in. No, my sheep hear my voice, verse 27, and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Look at the security of this. Let's break it down. Jesus saying, my sheep hear my voice. I call them, they follow. And I, I give them eternal life. You don't earn anything. They will never perish and nothing will snatch them out of my hand, not including you. Here's the thing. We can never lose our salvation. Once you are a Christian, you're always a Christian because nothing will snatch you out of Jesus' hand, including yourself. And Jesus really, in verse 30, lays down the gauntlet of deity claims and said, I and the Father are one. Again, verse 31, they understood it. The people, the hearers listening understood it. They picked up stones to stone him. But then Jesus has a few words with them uh, talk, uh, in confronting them, and they, they don't do anything. And so he asked him, why, why are you going to stone me? You know, is it for, 
you know, the good works. And they said, no, it's not for the good works. It's because for blasphemy, verse 33, because you're being, you, a man, make yourself God. And then Jesus challenges them saying, if I'm not doing the works of the father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe in the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am the father. He's saying, look at the evidence I'm leaning behind. Look at the gracious mercy of God, of people who are rejecting the Messiah, who are about to kill the Messiah. And look at the graciousness and the compassion of God that we should have with non-believers, that we should have with one another. That Jesus is saying, look to the evidence of my ministry, see and test it and see that it is true. Believe me. Why? So that you can have eternal life. I'm saying these things. I'm doing these things so that you can believe and have eternal life. And so see how Jesus is proving himself. But at the same time, compass, we need to have Jesus' same heart and apply it to others. When we do our good works, we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it to exalt God so, so others may believe in him for salvation or for encouragement to keep going. So he, some people thought to, uh, sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. And so he went across the Jordan. This will be end in John chapter 10 and verse 40. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. So they looked at the evidence that John the Baptist saying, this would happen. Jesus fulfills it. And verse 42, many believed in him there. And really showing that many believed, but really didn't believe. Right here, though, at the end of our reading this week, many believed and believed. So compass, my exhortation to you is look at the evidence that God is leaving behind in the testimony of Jesus Christ and believe in him. Repent of your sins and found salvation in Jesus Christ alone by surrendering your life. Don't be a fake believer by saying you believe just because you're here in Texas or you re read the Bible. This is why I'm a Christian. No, you're a Christian because you believe in Jesus Christ. And believing in Jesus Christ looks like you repent from your life, repent of your sin, turn from it, and trust in the only person who can give you life, the light of the world, the bread of life, the shepherd, Jesus Christ, trusting in his work alone to save you. And for him to give you eternal life, that's the only way that you are saved. And so I hope this reading either encourages you in your faith as you walk, along, uh, walk with Christ or convicts you into salvation, knowing that God, Jesus is a good shepherd calling out your voice and you need to follow. So Compass, I pray that this DBR podcast has been a, a benefit. We look forward to meeting again as we pick it up in John chapter 11. So Compass, see you next time.